someone. You're having sex with everyone that they've had sex with in the last five to seven years. Imagine you were told you had AIDS. Just imagine. NBC News presents Men, Women, Sex, and AIDS with Tom Brokaw. The littlest victims infected with AIDS acquired immune deficiency syndrome. It's crippling their body's defenses against a whole variety of deadly diseases. AIDS will kill most of these infants. Good evening. This is our third program on AIDS. We've done three because the story is so important and because it keeps getting worse. The numbers are simply staggering. In 1985, 5,000 Americans died from AIDS. In 1986, it is estimated that 9,000 died, and it is predicted that in 1991, 54,000 will die. AIDS is carried by a virus. A person can have that virus in his or her body for years before something, another virus perhaps, turns it into AIDS. Once you get that virus, you have it forever. It's estimated that one to one and a half million Americans now are currently infected with the virus. AIDS numbers are scary, and they involve a whole lot of informed guesswork. Many AIDS carriers do not come forward to be counted. They're afraid of being ostracized, of losing their jobs and friends. Many AIDS deaths are blamed on other causes. Victims and their families are afraid to be identified with AIDS, stigmatized by the disease. Medical experts agree that we are in the midst of an epidemic and while AIDS started in the male, homosexual, and drug communities in this country, it is now spreading at an alarming rate among heterosexuals. The number of identified heterosexual AIDS victims in the United States has doubled in the past year alone. It's expected to explode upwards by 1991. The Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. C. Everett Koop, has called the impact of AIDS devastating. Dr. Cooper, in your long medical career, have you ever seen anything as menacing as AIDS? After almost half a century in medicine, I can say that nothing is more frightening to me than the specter of AIDS in the future on public health. Do you think the fact that it is now moving rapidly into the heterosexual population of this country will make us more vigilant? Well, it should make us more vigilant because it opens up a whole new avenue of transmission and it means that many people will inadvertently or perhaps even deliberately be passing this on to their loved ones. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. We'll be hearing more from you later in the program. During the next hour here on this program, we'll be dealing with four major questions. The changing sexual habits of America as a result of AIDS, education about AIDS, a search for a cure and for ways of treating AIDS. And when we come back, we'll have a report as well on the spread of AIDS to women, heterosexual women who once thought that AIDS was someone else's problem. Slims. Slims because the victims lose weight and almost evaporate. It is a heterosexual disease in Africa, and it is deadly. Estimates are that 50,000 people have died in an 11-nation band of Central Africa covering the continent from the Congo to Tanzania. It is spreading in Europe as well, over 1,000 cases in France, lower but growing numbers in Germany, England, Italy, Belgium, and the Netherlands. In this hemisphere, Haiti has over 500 cases in that tiny country alone. In this country, people responding to a U.S. News CNN poll last month rated AIDS as second only to drugs as the most urgent problem facing the United States. More urgent now than crime, the farm dilemma, the deficit, or relations with the Soviet Union. But our NBC News Wall Street Journal poll of 800 adults shows a frightening reluctance to deal with the reality of AIDS. Well, more than two-thirds of those responding say they fear the spread of AIDS to the general population through sex between men and women. Fully three-quarters of those polled did not think that AIDS was a threat to their own personal health. They could very well be wrong. As NBC News science correspondent Robert Bazell reports now, the latest victims of AIDS are astounded, shocked, destroyed. Is it AIDS? Uh, yeah, for me? I mean... It was like it never occurred to me. It never occurred to my doctors. We first interviewed Susan four months ago. Though she had been diagnosed as having AIDS, she was feeling good, able to play with her son, Zachary. Today, Susan is weak, the result of some infection brought on by AIDS. Doctors have not yet figured out what it is. She is barely able to get out of bed, unable to pick up her son. 
Susan's story illustrates how real the threat of AIDS is to millions and millions of Americans. Susan is 32. She learned she had AIDS early last year, just after the birth of Zachary, three years after her marriage to Brad. I was really stunned because, I mean, it just never occurred to me. Um, you know, I don't use IV drugs, and I haven't had any blood transfusions. And I started thinking, and then when... Um, when I was in Canada several years ago, I was at a music festival. I had an affair with someone who's bisexual. Did you think about, did you know about AIDS then? There was some talk about it a little bit, um, just among people I knew in the gay community. It was like, at that point, nobody knew, you know, what it was. In 1982, when Susan had that brief affair, the virus that causes AIDS was spreading rapidly among male homosexuals. Doctors were not concerned about a threat to heterosexuals. Today, there is a lot of concern. Dr. Robert Redfield. When you look at the future, you basically see lots of young people dying in the prime of their lives because of nothing more than having a sexual experience. In 1982, scientists did not know what caused AIDS, only that it was an infectious agent new to humanity. Today, the scientists know the virus well. It's hard to imagine the virus being much worse. Dr. Robert Gallo headed the team which discovered the AIDS virus. It does so many things to avoid being destroyed by our defenses. It has learned how to attack the heart of the immune system and at the same time to change itself so to avoid our defense mechanisms. Sometimes I think, you know, why, why did this have to happen to me? I mean, I, I never did anything to deserve this. And I really... I feel very badly that, you know, I might not live to make the kind of contribution to this world that I'm capable of making. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult for me to deal with my child with the idea that I might never get to see him grow up. After the doctors discovered Susan had AIDS, they tested Brad and Zachary. Neither is infected with the AIDS virus. Susan did not pass it on to her husband or her son. We do know that about half the couples do infect their partners and about half the couples don't. Just like we know about half the moms transmit the virus to the babies and about half the moms don't transmit the virus to the babies. And why is that? I think that's a very important scientific question and we don't know the answer. This woman, we'll call her Mary, also got AIDS through heterosexual sex. A lover of hers five years ago was a drug addict. She works as a nurse in a northeastern city. Like Susan, she went on to get married and pregnant before she knew she was infected. She had twin girls. One is healthy. One died of AIDS. Tell me, why don't you want to be on camera today? Why don't, why don't you want your name used? Because people will shun me. And I have a deep fear of being shunned. People will point a finger at me. People will assume that I did something to get this disease. People will start being afraid of me, of my family, and whether I make it through this and, or not, my family still has to deal with the fact that I have AIDS. What did you know about AIDS when you had the affair with this man? Nothing. AIDS was vaguely mentioned. It was like AIDS was a gay disease, you know. But since then, you, you've learned about AIDS, you've heard about AIDS, mm -hmm. and didn't you ever stop to think, well, wait a minute, uh, several years ago I had an affair with a man who was a drug addict. And weren't you worried about that? No, because it was so long ago. You know, I was under the assumption you get AIDS, in a year's time you die. Maybe two years, maybe three, but you die. But I was under the assumption something told you you had AIDS. I didn't know that you could carry it for seven and eight years. I didn't know that you could carry it and not show symptoms. Public health officials estimate that today one and a half million Americans are infected with the AIDS virus. Most have no symptoms. All are potential carriers, possibly capable of infecting others. Dr. Gallo, they talk about a million and a half Americans, maybe more, infected with this virus. What's the prospect for those people? As far as I'm concerned, all 1.5 million infected people, if that's true, are very seriously at risk for developing a ser for disease either of the brain 
or of the immune system. Is it your view that this is a lifelong infection for every individual yes. who gets infected? Yes, of course. I chose to have sex. I got AIDS. That's my responsibility, and I accept it. You know, I'm not trying to put the responsibility on the person that gave it to me, because I chose to have sex with him. It wasn't like I was raped, you know? So I accept that responsibility. I just can't accept the responsibility of my child dying from it. Babies with AIDS are becoming increasingly common in the hospitals of big cities. Dr. John Johnson. What's the prognosis for a child with full-born AIDS? It's very poor. It's a devastating disease. Seventy percent of children diagnosed with AIDS die within six months. I could never envision her dying before she was an adult. It was never a possibility to me. And when the possibility came up that she wouldn't reach adulthood, it was extremely, extremely hard. I had to take a lifetime of my love and give it all to her in a matter of months. And when she died, it was the hardest thing in my life because I've never had anybody close to me die and nobody I love so much die. A simple blood test today can determine whether a person has been infected with the virus, whether he or she is possibly capable of infecting others. Some people are opposed to testing, fearing those who test positive will lose their homes, jobs, and insurance. Susan and Mary think there are good reasons why more people should be tested. You know, when you sleep with someone, you're not just, in terms of AIDS and other sexually transmitted diseases, you're not just sleeping with that person, you're sleeping with everyone they ever slept with. If a woman doesn't know that she's carrying the disease and she bears a child, there's overwhelming odds that the child is going to die. So I just believe there should be testing done for women of childbearing age because women don't know. The media makes it sound like uh, you have to be a drug addict, a prostitute, a gay person in order to get this disease. All you have to be is sexually active, pure and simple, just sexually active. Once again, we are joined by the Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. C. Everett Koop, who has called the impact of AIDS in this country devastating. Dr. Koop, are Americans by and large burying their head in the sand about AIDS? I don't know that they're burying their heads in the sand, but there are a number of people out there who seem terribly frightened about AIDS, who couldn't catch AIDS if they could, if they really wanted to. On the other hand, the people with the high-risk behaviors, I don't think are paying as much attention to the educational messages they should, not only for their own health and safety, but for that of those that they have sexual contact with. We have so much information available about AIDS, however, through the general news media, through specialty publications now. Why is it that people aren't addressing it if they're a member of that high-risk group? Well, I think young people have a sense of immortality, and they think, well, that applies to the general public, but not really to me. And then when you're dealing with a sexual practice, I think it's very difficult for people to come to grips with the fact that if they want to be safe and protect their sexual partners, they really have to change their lifestyles. As you know, critics are saying as well that the federal government has not invested nearly enough resources in this, specifically money. Are you disappointed in the amount of money that the federal government has put forward in AIDS? Well, let's put that I'm very encouraged by the increase, about 23% this year, in our budget for AIDS, of which about 25% will go to education, and that does please me. But the fact of the matter is, sir, you call this one of the most menacing health problems you have ever seen. It really calls for all-out combat, doesn't it? It does indeed, and we are committed to do that right here in the United States Public Health Service, and I think you'll see some major changes in the very near future. Do you think that President Reagan is aware of the gravity of the situation? Well, he certainly has had submitted to him the report he asked me to write and has reviewed it, and I know that he will be paying attention to AIDS at several meetings this very week. Dr. Coop, thank you again. We've heard a lot in these past few years about the sexual revolution in America. Now, with AIDS moving into the heterosexual community, the question arises as to whether there is a counter-revolution underway. Some answers to that question in our next segment.
There is a lot in this program that could make you uneasy. It makes all of us uneasy. But it is important and it is unavoidable. After all, AIDS is a killer. It is transmitted in the most intimate ways, during sex or the exchange of blood. The subject matter for a long time has been taboo, but it can be taboo no longer. As we have seen, it is a matter of life and death. In our NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, we questioned single people. While more than half said that they would ask a new sexual partner for his or her sexual history before agreeing to relations, only 34% said they would ask a new partner to be tested for AIDS. The sexual revolution may not be over, but as NBC correspondent Maria Shriver found out, it is certainly changing. Maria's report begins with a flashback to 1975, the sexual revolution in full flower, the NBC News documentary of women and men and a young woman named Erica. I guess I'm into a type of sporting sex um, with a variety of people who I like. I'm not into one-nighters but I'm into a lot of what's known as casual, short-term relationships. Um, and not necessarily with just one guy. <laughs> 1975. It wasn't that long ago that much of the nation had shed its sexual inhibitions. Sexual freedom was in. It seemed like everyone was doing it and talking about it. Sex was hot. nineteen eighty seven to hear the talk you would think the nation's sex life is in a deep freeze as singles ushered in the new year they sounded like they were ushering out more than a decade of carefree casual sex one night stands and multiple partners now you can't just like wham bam thank you man those days are over the talk has less to do with morality and more to do with the reality that sex with the wrong person could lead to AIDS free love now has a price well, I'm really careful like who I go out with and really discuss it with them and be very open and I expect them to be very open with me. You have to basically take relationships more seriously. You just can't jump into them and jump out of them the way you could before. It's growing and it's really scary. Experts say that AIDS and the fear of catching it should be scary to all of us. If you're single, you should be scared. Married couples are at risk if they engage in an extramarital affair. And steady relationships aren't immune either, because it's estimated that 90% of the people infected don't even know it. With all of this talk about AIDS, incredibly, studies show that we're only slightly more concerned about it than we were a year ago. With no cure in sight and the epidemic spreading, doctors say we're not changing our sexual habits fast enough. Is there cause for panic right now in 1987? I think so. I think very definitely so. Dr. Teresa Crenshaw is president of the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. She is also chairperson of that group's task force on AIDS. We have more heterosexuals infected today than we had homosexuals infected five years ago. And if heterosexuals do not want to repeat the homosexual disaster with AIDS, where so many are infected and dying, they're going to have to pay attention pretty soon. Last year. <laughs> Last year, yesterday. According to the NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, an overwhelming number of Americans still do not believe that AIDS is their problem. 92% of those polled said that AIDS has had no effects on the way they conduct themselves socially. 73% said they do not feel threatened by it. Apparently, the joys of sex still outweigh the perils of sex. There's no better place to see the mating game in full swing than on the ski slopes in Utah. I like this. This is fun. <laughs> if you need sex, if you want sex, you're going to go out and you're going to get it. Um, regardless of the fact whether you can get AIDS or not. And that's it's just the way it is. The person I try to go out with, I, I usually assume to be clean. Truthfully, it's the last thing on my mind. High school and college students from around the country sat down with us to talk about the threat of AIDS and how it's affected their lives. Especially I'm from Miami, Florida, in Miami, I mean, it's a big city, you gotta be careful. How would you be careful? How would you show that you're careful? You stay within a close range of friends. I mean, you don't, I mean, I don't go out and meet 
people I don't know. Well, most of the girls I date are from my school, and it's a pretty small school, and I know them, so I'm really not worried at all. You think you know their sexual history? Enough, so I don't have to be worried yet. <laughs> when you have sex with someone, you're having sex with everyone that they've had sex with in the last five to seven years. And even if you think you can judge that person's character, you can't possibly judge all those others. So you find all of this kind of frank, upfront talk about sex pretty embarrassing? Not really, because you, you can't get ready to have sex with a girl and ask her if she's clean. To, you know, have you got AIDS? Or have you got VD? If you ask a girl like that, you have to forget it. You don't have anything that night. So that's the way it goes. You can't really be frank about it. We don't have the luxury to be embarrassed any longer. Would you take that first step to ask somebody to take a blood test, to ask a guy to wear a condom in order to ensure as much safety as is possible? If I cared about myself and the person, but I don't think I'd have the nerve. That, that's rude. <laughs> it's rude. Yeah. It's very rude. It's rude to ask somebody to take... It's insulting precaution. to them. It's insulting to them almost. You know, if someone came up to me and, and questioned me if I was an AIDS victim, you know, an AIDS victim, I'd be like, what? What is safe sex? Sex with your wife. That's safe sex. Go no, ahead that's, not even safe. Wanna... that's not even well, safe. That's not even safe. Well, for all intents and purposes, <laughs> sex with your wife is safe sex. I define safe sex as celibacy or masturbation with the next best thing that could be completely safe is monogamy with a trustworthy partner who's not already infected. I think the main hard thing for um, teenagers or college kids is the, the thought of death. I mean, it's not a reality, especially if it hasn't happened to someone you know, you don't think, well, I can die. But if it hits home, your brother, your sister, one of your friends gets it, that's, that's when it's going to change. If the heterosexual community waits until that time to wake up, it's going to be too late. Tragedy has caused a dramatic turnaround in the gay community. Gays have learned the hard way that monogamy and even celibacy are now their ticket to life. Kelly Bray. There's a lot of anger. Anger for the fact that heterosexuals are not educated about it. They're afraid of it, but they don't want to listen, and they don't want to learn. Perhaps because so far the statistics haven't been dramatic enough to convince straight America to give up the hard-won freedoms of the sexual revolution. Freedoms that Erica talked explicitly about back in 1975. Now I engage in group sex, and I love it and I enjoy it. It's a change of pace. How different is life today? Very. <laughs> I mean, I can look at that, and it, it's an entirely different behavior. <laughs> well, and the AIDS crisis is so... Uh theoretical from where we live in a small town. I was joking with Erica uh, when we found out we were coming on this program. I said, what are you going to tell them that the AIDS crisis is, uh, to you, is like the Afghanistan war. It's just so removed, uh, it's hard to be concrete about what are you going to tell your daughter 15 years from now about AIDS? I don't know. Doctors say it will not be long before each of us knows someone who has died of AIDS. But so far, that chilling image hasn't scared most of us. In 1987, AIDS hasn't stopped the party yet. We heard from Dr. Teresa Crenshaw during Maria Shriver's report. A medical doctor, Dr. Crenshaw is the president of the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. And she has that group's AIDS task force as well. Dr. Crenshaw, tell me what you're seeing in California in terms of the patterns of relationships these days between married couples or couples who are thinking about getting divorced. Well, in couples that are coming to my clinic, I've seen a major change. Couples are working harder to preserve their marriages. They will tell me that it's a terrible time to be single. And this motivates them to try to avoid that condition. I'm seeing commitments develop in people who comment they would really rather play the field, but it's too frightening now. I'm particularly seeing those who are married who weren't completely happy in their relationship and were supplementing their sex a little on the side, uh, not having affairs any longer and becoming more conservative. Dr. Crenshaw, as you are well aware, condoms are back in fashion once again in America. And a lot of people believe that a condom is a safe shield against AIDS. Is that an overstatement? It is an overstatement. Condoms are certainly better than nothing. And if used in combination with a spermicide, 
then if you are going to be unwise and have sex with someone that you are not secure is safe, better to use them than not. But basically, they're Russian roulette. And we already have two reported cases of women who have gotten the AIDS virus from their partners who were depending upon condoms. So it isn't the complete answer. You can't use condom sense only. You must use your common sense, too. Dr. Crenshaw, as you're well aware, the very nature of the discussion that you and I are having right now will make a lot of people in this country uncomfortable. They think it's not necessary to talk about these subjects on television. Is that part of the problem in this country in dealing with AIDS? It is part of the problem, and yet this AIDS virus is ruthless. Ignorance is no defense, and we must respond to the challenge. Dr. Crenshaw, thank you very much. In our next segment, the question of educating our young, yes, and our old as well, about the dangers of AIDS and the ways of avoiding it. And AIDS continues. Here is Tom Brokaw. Fighting AIDS comes down to taking precautions, being informed, informed about the danger of AIDS, how it can spread, how to protect oneself against the disease. That again comes down to education. Dr. Ann Welburn Mowgli is the Executive Director of the Sex Education Council of the United States, and she is with us tonight as well. Dr. Mowgli, uh, the Surgeon General of the United States, C. Everett Cooper, said that we must begin to teach eight and nine year old children about the danger of AIDS. Is there a possibility that that will make sex a horror show for them? Sure, it's a possibility, but it doesn't have to be if we understand how children at that age think and understand about health and about sexuality. Um, that we need to do this in a very careful, thoughtful way. As you know, there are a number of people in this country who would actively resist the idea of that kind of sex education in the public schools because they think it's a parental responsibility. That's What's right. wrong with their argument? There's nothing wrong with their argument as long as young children and parents get the information and help they need. I think in many communities, education in schools is not acceptable, and then the alternatives need to be to turn to religious groups, to community groups, reaching out to parents so that they can provide information to, ch to their children in the ways that they, they feel are appropriate. Dr. Mowgli, I'm a parent. I have older teenage daughters at this point, and while we have a very open relationship, I know that we still sometimes find it difficult to talk to each other about sex. Right. How in the world do you talk to a 12 or 13 year old about AIDS and sex and how to prevent it? Well, I think the, the thing that I hear time and time again from young and middle and late adolescent children is how much they want to talk about the questions and concerns they have about sexuality and they're hoping that their parents will bring the subject up, will tell them that they're concerned about it and open doors to communication. Children this age don't really want their parents to tell them what to do or give them answers, but knowing that their parents are willing to talk with them, that they're aware that this is a question or a concern that they might have questions about, says so much to young children in terms of knowing that they can go there when they do have a problem. Thank you, Doctor. It would seem that AIDS is something that none of us can know too much about. In our NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, better than 9 out of 10 said that they would approve of sex and AIDS education in public schools. But this issue remains very controversial because necessarily it requires some very explicit discussion. You're about to see some of that right now. NBC News correspondent Connie Chung reports on this debate. There is now a danger that has become a threat to us all. It is a deadly disease and there is no known cure. Until there is a cure, education is our only hope of stopping the spread of AIDS. This is how the British government is getting that message to its people. So far, it's been confined to small groups, but it's spreading. So protect yourself. If you ignore AIDS, it could be the death of you. So don't die of ignorance. It's dramatic, but it sidesteps the basic question about AIDS education. How explicit should we be in talking about AIDS and sex? What's sodomy? Um, anal sex. What does that have to do with AIDS? Because the anal skin is so um, delicate, thin, whatever, it's easier for the disease to pass through. It's easier Classes like this one in a New York City high school are essential because more than half our children have sex before they turn 18. This may be too explicit for many parents, but it works. Are you all afraid of getting AIDS? Very. What's the most important thing you learned about AIDS today as it applies directly to you? Restraint from, like, too many sexual partners. 
And when you do use it, use a condom because that's one way that you're sure you're not going to get it because it can't get through the rubber. Don't mess with drugs that, you know, like hypodermic needles. And you just got to be careful. These simple lessons about AIDS are a matter of life and death, especially in New York City, where the AIDS epidemic is most concentrated. But the principal of the high school we visited asked us to keep its location secret for fear of harassment. Even here, straight talk about AIDS and sex is controversial. This film was commissioned by the New York City Board of Education to show kids how they can't catch AIDS and how they can. But it's not being shown in most New York City schools. Once again, talking about sex, AIDS, and condoms is too controversial. Consider this scene from the film. I mean, I use the film. It's the yeah. easiest. It's the most convenient. I use condoms. Just can't believe it. Yeah, I don't think anybody uses those that. anymore. That's not the point. Well, well, if you go on the pill, you, you won't get pregnant, but... It's no guarantee you're not going to get AIDS or syphilis or something. She doesn't have to worry about AIDS. AIDS is a game. No, it's not. How in the no. no, it's not. Both people, but everybody can get yeah. AIDS now. Well, I just don't worry about it. It's hard sometimes to get kids to responsibly do their homework. And now we're asking them to use contraceptives responsibly, and they won't, and they don't, and they admit it. Monsignor John Woolsey is a member of the Coalition of Concerned Clergy, a group that is dead against urging young people to use condoms to help prevent the spread of AIDS. The only thing that's going to prevent AIDS is a, a massive demonstration uh, of education that engagement in sexual activity is improper. Even if you're learning about AIDS in a sex education class, as some people say they should be teaching you morality and they should be teaching you say no to sex, like no to drugs. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. Though. You can't tell somebody to say no. Yeah. Everybody has to make a judgment for themselves. That's true. This way, we learn the consequences. I know people who are sexually active who don't know the first thing. What they're doing is they're teaching us about sex. Sex is really life, you know, and things that go on in life. What they're doing is they're helping us the right way, not hearing it in the street or reading it off a magazine or something. What's difficult for youngsters is that they may understand it, but they don't necessarily become responsible when the time comes. But we have to give them a chance to be responsible. Not telling them anything makes it sure that they cannot be here responsibly. Dr. Mathilde Krim is the co-chairman of the American Foundation for AIDS Research. People here do not talk about sex, and they feel uncomfortable talking about AIDS. Well, they're going to have to learn to do it, because what's the alternative? Are we, the alternative is death. Are we going to let our young people kill themselves out of ignorance. I'm not trying to be too formal, but would you like dinner? And, you know, maybe sex? I'll consider it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. Or maybe sex and dinner. I mean, it's <laughs> How can women talk to men about sex and protection from AIDS? In Atlanta, these women are role-playing and planning what they call safe sex parties, something like Tupperware parties where women who may have more than one sexual partner can get answers to questions that are just plain embarrassing. Um, how likely is it the AIDS virus will be transmitted during vaginal intercourse when a condom is used, during a shower or bath taken with your partner, while mutual masturbation with a female partner, or during an erotic massage? <laughs> These questions are really, woo, you know, you kind of have to say, oh, no, I've never. So you want to kind of ease into this a little bit. Every single day, AIDS kills all kinds of people, randomly. People like you. The people who produced this ad have yet to broadcast it for fear it's too provocative. But it seems almost prudish compared to this British ad that confronts the relationship between sex and AIDS head on. Who did you sleep with last night? I don't know. Who slept with her last night? I don't know. How do you get AIDS? I don't know. It's not just gays who get AIDS, you know. Sleep around and you're at risk. If you must sleep with more than one partner, you must wear a condom. Because if you do get AIDS, what can the doctors do to save you? I don't know. And on Norwegian television, the message is equally direct. The danger of being infected is considerably reduced when a contraceptive is used. 
You should not have many sexual partners and ought to be particular in your choice of partner. In France, the ads for condoms, or preservatives as they are called, show a family situation unthinkable in the U.S., where you don't even see any ads for condoms on TV. Some of the French ads are so explicit, we can't even show you parts of them. It makes you wonder what's acceptable and what goes too far. We told the free-thinking New York students you met earlier about these French ads, and suddenly found them transformed into seemingly conservative adults. Would you let your little kids watch something like that? Sure. That would be out of the question. We'll no doubt continue to disagree, but the AIDS epidemic is spreading so fast, the time for debate is running out. When we come back, the high cost of the frustrating war against AIDS. The medical community realizes that we're in an all-out war against the AIDS epidemic, and the public is becoming aware of that as well. Six out of ten of those responding to our polls said the government simply is not doing enough to combat AIDS. There is the real question of commitment. Dr. Jerome Groupman of Harvard has been critical of the amount of resources that have been allocated to this state in the fight against AIDS, and he's with us tonight as well. Dr. Groupman, how much will AIDS cost Americans in terms of health care by 1990? The estimates are between uh, 5 and $15 billion uh, in the United States alone for the cost uh, to care for AIDS patients and patients with other uh, disorders related to the AIDS virus, so-called ARC, or AIDS-related complex. And where's that money going to come from in your judgment? Well, it'll come to some degree from the government in terms of uh, uh, disability and uh, Social Security. It'll come from insurance, and it'll be absorbed by the healthcare industry because many patients don't have the resources to pay for their medical bills. Right across the board, then, AIDS is going to raise the cost of general health care in America, isn't it? Yeah, I think AIDS will significantly change the uh, economics of health care in the United States. Let's talk specifically about the care for AIDS patients. They do require a lot of specialized care. Are we prepared to do that at this time? I think there's been very little planning in terms of how to care for the numbers of AIDS patients that we'll see over the next five years. Patients generally go through at least two phases of the illness. There's an acute phase where they have need for intensive medical care in so-called acute care hospitals. And then many patients uh, live for several months or even a year or two with chronic diseases and require chronic care. And there's very little that's been established to care for patients in a hospice or chronic care facility. And the acute care hospitals, particularly in cities like New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, are simply overwhelmed with the numbers of cases. Dr. Grubman, you'd like to see a national commission against AIDS. Yeah, I was on the uh, National Academy of Science Institute of Medicine uh, uh, committee that recommended that there be a national commission to help plan public policy to deal with not only the economic issues, but also the research and scientific issues. And there's been a real lack of leadership or forethought in terms of planning for what will be uh, in five years. Dr. Grootman, thank you very much. Although, as we reported earlier in this program, Americans think that AIDS is second only to drugs as a national problem, our poll showed that people felt that cancer research was more important by a margin of two to one. And by a smaller margin, those responding felt that heart disease research was also more important. In the public and medical sectors of this country, AIDS now is becoming a big business. Recently, word that the drug ribavirin might be used in AIDS therapy made its manufacturer's stock jump $25 a share. Then, when researchers expressed some skepticism about the drug's effectiveness, the stock dropped $4. The business of AIDS is about dollars and cents and about life and death as NBC correspondent Peter Kent reports now. Like Americans everywhere, those afflicted with AIDS believe a cure is inevitable, only a matter of time. But with an average life expectancy of barely 13 months from diagnosis, time is too short for today's patient. The greater inevitability is death. The harsh reality, there is no cure. Faced with projections that there will have been hundreds of thousands of new patients within five years, it's now time to consider how the economics of AIDS will soon affect all of us. I've already been hospitalized 14 times since last November. I mean, for a couple of series. Um, Do you have any savings left? None. Not one time. 
For people with AIDS, the costs are devastating, but healthcare experts like Richard Yezo warn AIDS will eventually cost society at large big money. I am frightened. It is going to be a big problem. If it is already a big problem, it's going to get hysterical soon. New York City. Almost a third of the country's AIDS cases have occurred here. The people of this city need the sort of financial solutions the rest of us will soon be looking for. The problem is where to look. Should it be to the nation's laboratories, where millions of dollars have been spent with only limited success? Or to the hospitals that are already feeling the pressures of treating thousands of AIDS patients? Or is the answer in the marketplace, where American problem solving has always been driven by the promise of profits? Hey, Todd, St. Clair's, may I help you? St. Clair's Hospital in mid-Manhattan was nearly bankrupt four years ago. Last year, St. Clair's found money in AIDS. Not for profit, but with a special state subsidy for AIDS patients, enough to keep the institution open. Richard Yezo runs St. Clair's. Costs are dropping at St. Clair's because our length of stays are dropping. We feel that we have about as economical a rate package as you can get. We get about 550 a day for an AIDS patient in an acute state. Okay. $550 a day may sound expensive, but it's a lot less than the national average of more than $700 a day. The staff at St. Clair's credits their specialized AIDS ward for cutting costs and reducing the average patient stay. That sort of efficiency will be terribly important given the projection that in 1991, AIDS patients will need 4.6 million days in hospitals. That's more beds than are currently used by lung cancer or traffic accident patients. Dr. Deborah Spicehandler is medical director of St. Clair's AIDS unit. We started out with six patients about a year ago. We have now 60 beds available for patients with AIDS, and we will probably expand to over 100 in the next year. But that will not be enough to meet the need of AIDS patients. And not all of those needs are medical. Hugh, a 39-year-old veteran, got hooked on drugs in Vietnam. Now he has AIDS. After three months at St. Clair's, Hugh is almost well enough to check out. But... Yeah, the, the basic thing is I don't have a place to go. I don't, I don't like saying that, you know. I'm, I'm ashamed of that position. But yeah, it's, I'm here because I need a place to go. Hugh has family. But they, as the relatives of so many AIDS patients, can't or won't take him in. Ah, Evelyn, I've got some good news for you. I just got a call from... You and the other patients count on the hospital staff to help find, through a city agency, outside accommodation. Possibly by the weekend, beginning of the new year, you'll have a place to live for you and your children. AIDS helpline. People with AIDS can't be placed in shelters for the homeless for their own protection. They'd be exposed to too much disease. Anita Vitelli runs New York City's AIDS Crisis Intervention Center. The city spends over a million dollars a week, very often providing the first assistance to AIDS patients who find themselves suddenly destitute. We have people who have worked all their lives, um, who now find themselves confronted with a disease that takes away their ability to work and support themselves. They haven't saved any money, and they're not prepared to face a long illness, and they're not prepared to face death. Mark is an AIDS outpatient. He needs help from the city while waiting for Social Security disability payments from the state and federal government. I'm out of money. I am literally out of money. When he contracted AIDS, Mark lost his hairdressing business and his savings. Oh, hi, Mr. Mills. How are you today? Mark's particularly concerned about his future because he optimistically believes the experimental drug he's taking will prolong his life. He's part of a national test group of AIDS patients receiving a new drug called AZT. Which brings us to the profit side of AIDS economics. Any drug which eventually proves effective against AIDS will not only save lives, but could also make a lot of money for investors. AZT has shown some promise in early testing, and the stock of Burroughs Welcome, the British company which makes it, more than doubled its value. The biggest earnings in the AIDS market now are in the field of diagnostic blood testing, a market worth more than $100 million a year. In the past five years, companies making condoms have almost doubled sales, 
to $338 million a year. Wall Street recognizes the big profits which stand to be made in AIDS-related stocks. But it's an extremely volatile market. Stocks go up, stocks go down. That's the nature of risk in this whole area. So E.F. Hutton Vice President Lynn Paul. Most major U.S. investment companies now have executives like her assigned to follow AIDS-related stocks. The stocks rise and fall dramatically on any whisper of bad news or good news. And it's rough for investors because for any of these companies, there's a certain amount of risk, but also the potential for significant reward. Eventually, there will be winners in the labs and in the investment community. But until a cure or effective drug treatment is found, the U.S. can only try to cope with the consequences of the disease itself. By 1991, the demographics of AIDS will have changed radically. More than 80% of all AIDS cases will be outside New York and San Francisco. Medical economist Peter Arno. It is spreading now faster outside of the, the big cities that currently have the burden at a greater rate. So uh, it's a problem that the entire country has got to uh, face and begin planning for. No one's predicting that AIDS will bankrupt the U.S. health system, even with forecasts that direct medical costs of the virus could approach $16 billion within five years. But experts contend AIDS is increasingly revealing the weaknesses and shortcomings <laughs> of our health system. They say it's time to develop a more cohesive national policy with regard to the hospital beds, the patient care, and the money for people with AIDS. It's no longer possible to dismiss AIDS as someone else's problem. I'll be back with some final thoughts in just a moment. Developments that is so frightening, so overwhelming in its consequences, we can barely bring ourselves to think about it. Moreover, because of how AIDS is primarily transmitted, through sexual relations, it is a subject that many people are uncomfortable dealing with in public discussion. Nevertheless, AIDS is a monster that will not go away by ignoring it. It will only grow to proportions that are even more difficult to manage if we don't confront it now, if we refuse to educate ourselves and our children about its place in our lives, if we don't change some of our patterns of living, if we refuse to commit to this battle, the resources required. AIDS is a plague, and nothing fuels a plague like ignorance or indifference. I'm Tom Brokaw. Good night from all of us at NBC News. When you have sex with someone, you're having sex with everyone that they've had sex with in the last five to seven years. If it hasn't happened to someone you know, you don't think, well, I can die. The person I try to go out with, I, I usually assume to be clean. AIDS? Uh, you know, to me? I mean... It was like it never occurred to me. I didn't know that you could carry it for seven and eight years. Use a condom because that's one way that you're sure you're not going to get it. Don't mess with drugs that, you know, like hypodermic needles. The media makes it sound like you have to be a drug addict, a gay person, in order to get this disease. All you have to be is sexually active.